My daughter's starting kindergarten, has started kindergarten this fall, and I'm being reminded that every school has its traditions. I, uh, I was at a, uh, a, a middle school, or um, at, at, at every school, right? It doesn't matter what school we are a part of, elementary, middle, high school, college. We have our traditions. I, I was at a, when I was in high school, I was uh, on a trip to a college visit, checking out different schools in western Pennsylvania, and we drove down to Pittsburgh one day, and we visited Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, while we were there getting a tour of the campus, we went through one of the buildings and we came out into this area, kind of the green space uh, uh, quad area. And there was a little fence there. Probably didn't run much longer than from one side of the sanctuary to another. And it seemed kind of strange because it wasn't fencing anything off. And it, it was a strangely thick fence and it was painted bright colors. I think we have a picture of that. Let's put that up here. Uh, and, and our tour guide for that day uh, said, told us about the tradition of the fence at Carnegie Mellon University. Back in the 1920s, somebody decided, let's build a fence as a gathering place for students to meet and talk and whatever. It wasn't very effective until one group on campus decided to paint the fence and paint the details about an upcoming event on this fence. And, and then it became a thing. So, so different groups would vie for the ability to paint the fence, and they would claim it. That was their way of, of advertising something that was coming up or just saying, hey, we're on campus, we matter, we're a part of this community. And so a, a tradition grew up around this fence, and, and, and there are specific rules about how the fence can be painted. Uh, it has to be painted between the hours of midnight and sunrise, whatever time that is, okay? Um, and, and, uh, and usually when groups paint the fence, they then sit there and guard the fence to keep any other group from painting the fence, right? So it becomes a, a bit of a competition. As you can imagine, uh, the, this, oh, also the fence has to be painted with brushes. Can't use rollers, can't use paint sprayers, has to be brushes. I think that's fascinating. Anyway, um, so, so year after year, week after week, all these layers of paint getting painted onto this fence. In 1993, the original wooden fence that was put up collapsed under the weight. 600 layers of paint. Yeah, six inches thick, okay? At the time, it held the Guinness re record for the most painted object. Yes, evidently that's a record. I think we have a picture of some of the layers there. Layer after layer after layer. We've been in the book of Jeremiah lately, and we've been talking about the words of judgment that Jeremiah brings to the people. Why are these words of judgment necessary? Over and over again, we hear these words of judgment and it becomes, if you're reading through the book, it becomes kind of repetitive and, and really depressing after a while. What, was, what, what the problem was, that it was the nation was numb. They couldn't feel anything. They were out of touch with reality. Why? Because they were covered over by layers and layers of sin and idolatry. And over the years, these things covered them so that they couldn't feel anymore. They, 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 they couldn't see reality for what it, what it was. That's why the word of Jeremiah comes so forcefully, because God wants to cut through all those layers so that his people would recognize his heart, would feel again. Because if you can't feel, there's no hope for change. There's no hope for the future. One time on campus at Carnegie Mellon University, a group of freshman students, I don't know what they were thinking, decided to take some hacksaws to the fence. And so they cut through several layers of paint. That's what Jeremiah is trying to do with these words of judgment. He's trying to peel back the layers because he knows that there's a heart under there. There's, there, there's people created in the image of God. They're the people who God has made a covenant relationship with unique among all nations in the world. He's called these people his, his, his people. If Jeremiah can just push through. And so sometimes these words of judgment are not meant even necessarily to bring them to repentance or to make them live according to the covenant as much as he's just trying to cut through all the layers to get to the heart. What happens when you start to cut through the layers? When these freshman students cut through these layers and peeled it back, word got out pretty quickly around campus. And f uh, groups of students flocked to heal the fence. And they brought paint. And, and they, they, they cut out the parts around it and they started painting it over to heal it. That's what the, that's what the false prophets in Judah did too. 
As, as Jeremiah was preaching these words, trying to pierce to the heart, they tried to paint it over with fantasies, absolutely false hopes. We talked a little bit about this last week. They, they spoke peace, peace, when there was no peace, Jeremiah says. The, the word that, that came to the exiles who were in Babylon. Uh, Jeremiah tells us that the prophets there were saying, only two years and the yoke of Babylon will be broken. You'll be brought back to your homes. Jeremiah says it's a false hope. They were trying to paint over it. Keep, keep the people unfeeling. Live in this fantasy world. Uh, my grandfather, uh, in his later years, had some trouble uh, with falling. And, and I, I don't mean to make light of falling, because I know that this is a very serious thing. But um, it, 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 was, it was somewhat humorous, because he would, he, he, would, he would fall very slowly. But he wouldn't necessarily realize that he was falling. And so as he's going down, and we're standing there trying to help him up, he says, I'm fine, I'm fine, as he's headed down to the ground. That's kind of what the prophets are doing, isn't it? It's fine. It's fine. There's nothing to see here as the people are being carried off to Babylon. It's fine. Only two years. God's going to restore. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Paint the layers back on. So Jeremiah brings words of judgment and doom and destruction. His call was to uproot and tear down, remember? To overthrow and destroy, bring disaster. Because, because Jeremiah is trying to pierce through the numbness of the people with the pathos of God, the very ache of God's heart for his people. If only Jeremiah can represent and reveal and embody the heart of God to his people, maybe his people will feel again. What happens when they do feel again? A lot of emotions probably. Some of those being grief. Remorse perhaps. Mourning at what's happening, at least at the destruction that's coming, if not a true repentance. We prayed a prayer of repentance a few weeks ago, um, and, uh, and, and, and we prayed those, those words, oh God, what have we done? Have you ever been in a relationship or a friendship before where there's been so some sort of breach of trust? I, and, 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 and you have this conversation where one of you has to open up your eyes to see what's actually happened. I remember a friend, a close friend of mine came to me one time and he said, you know, when we're in groups of people and I start talking about something that I really care about, I notice that you get this look on your face and this tone in your voice that's really dismissive. And I had to look at my actions and examine my heart. And I realized that, yeah, you're right. I didn't even realize I was doing it. I was blind to it. What have I done? When we cut through those layers, whether it's in our relationship with God or our relationship with others, um, oftentimes we find ourselves in a place of grief. And if we're not careful, and if it seems like there are no options from where we're standing, that grief can quickly lead to despair. As a sophomore at North Park University, I didn't go to Carnegie Mellon. Otherwise, I would have been a picture of me by that fence. <laughs> a sophomore at uh, North Park University and getting toward the end of the term, it was the end of the year, moving out of apartment and, and trying to finish uh, my work. And some of you, uh, uh, maybe like me, like to leave things to the last minute. Well, I left a very large project to the last minute and I figured, oh, I'll get it done. I always get it done. I'll get it done. And then the night before the term ended, I realized, oh my goodness, I'm not going to get it done. And I called my dad. He was on his way to, uh, to pick me up um, from his, driving from Pennsylvania to Chicago. And he, he, later he told me, as soon as I picked up the phone, I could hear the panic in your voice. Oh, what have I done? What have I done? There's no other way that this is going to play out. This semester is going to end and I won't have submitted the largest project for my term. You see how quickly our, our, our grief and remorse can turn to despair if we see no other option, no other way out. What would it have been like to be a child of the exile, I wonder? Those people who were carried from Jerusalem into Babylon. What would it be like to be a kid who's in a family who finds themselves living in, in Babylon and they had no choice and no say in the matter? And the reason they're there, they hear through Jeremiah, is because of what their parents have done. There's no other option. There's no hope for my future. Here we are in exile. That's why the words, I, I, it took me a while to study this. I, I was confused about all this sour grapes stuff that you may have heard in the text. 
The parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. That's what the children of the exile are feeling. Hey, but even before we got here, you messed it up for us. And now there's no way out. And, and all we see is a bleak future. It'd be easy to slip into despair. Some of you have seen the, movie, the Lord of the Rings movies. The last of the three, Lord of the Rings, Return of the King. Uh, the, the, the enemy army is marching against Minas Tirith, which is this city that's kind of a beacon of light in the midst of the darkness. And the ruler of the city at the time is a steward. He's not the real king. But he is, is grieving the marching of these armies. He is, he is seen into the heart of darkness. He knows the power of, of, of evil. And, and the, uh, the, his army brings in his son, who is badly wounded at, the, at death's door, brings him in before the steward, and he sees his son, and he thinks his son is going to die. And then he, he walks over to the edge, and he looks over the edge of the balcony, and he sees all the enemy armies laid out in front of him. This is the moment where they're supposed to engage in battle. And what does he do? He absolutely slips into despair. There's no way out. And so he shouts, abandon your posts, run for your life, because there is no way out. If we're not careful, grief and mourning and remorse can lead to despair. And yet, Scripture has another word about this, doesn't it? Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, he's describing the values of the kingdom of God. What does he say? Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Jesus knew the same thing that Jeremiah knew, was that unless the people can feel, they can't feel comfort. If you can't feel grief, if you're lost under those layers and layers of sin and brokenness, and, and then you heap on the pain and the, of the destruction of Jerusalem and all this, they can't feel grief, neither can they feel comfort. Jeremiah says, uh, you've, you've got to feel in order to find healing. Grief does not need to lead to despair. Because our God creates options where there seem to be no options. It's like the nation of Israel pressed up against the Red Sea. There's no way out. God makes a way where there is no way. And so our words today are actually not words of despair, are they? They're words of hope. They're, they're words that Jeremiah speaks to those to whom the layers have been peeled back, who, who are perhaps on the edge of despair, he says, do not despair. Because let me tell you that there is an option that you can't see that's being created by our God right now in, on, in a way that only he can do. These are words of hope. The second half of Jeremiah's call, not just to uproot and to tear down, but also to build and to plant, to create new possibilities. So Jeremiah speaks of a new covenant a new covenant. And the key word of this covenant is forgiveness. It's easy to miss it, but it's at the very end of the passage that was read here today. Verse 34, no longer will they teach their neighbor, excuse me, at the very end of that verse, for I will forgive their wickedness, says the Lord, and I will remember their sins no more. The foundation of this new covenant is, is the miracle of forgiveness. That God is going to create a way where there seems to be no way. Freedom from the sin that has bound the people, that has encased them, kept them from feeling. Why is that? Because forgiveness breaks the cycles of sin and violence. Forgiveness is truly a miracle, I believe. And, and, and it breaks the cycles of sin and violence. Again, to the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is teaching about, uh, about all these Old Testament uh, laws that have been given. Jesus says, it's been said to you, um, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, if someone slaps you on the cheek, turn your other cheek as well. What's Jesus doing here? He's, he's, he's uh, offering the people a way out of the cycles of violence. Do you see? Be, be, because if, if we're living in a world where it's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, uh, the, the revenge is never on an even playing field, is it? Every hurt goes a little further than the last one. And, and, and when we retaliate against one another and, and quickly things snowball in, in, into pain and brokenness, Jesus says there is a way out of this cycle. That's what Jesus came to offer us. 
Think about the cycle that Israel was locked in. Through all the kings that, 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 that led the people, they went through these cycles of renewal and, and coming to God and saying, yes, we are your people. We'll put away our idols. We will worship you. And then God blesses them and brings them into a place of abundance. And then that king dies. The leadership changes. And the people forget about the Lord and they go back to the idols. And, and, and once again, they find themselves in that place where God is bringing judgment and, and, and they cry out to God, oh God, save us, we are your people. And this cycle goes over and over and over again. God wants to offer us a way out of those cycles that lead to death and destruction. It's what Jesus has come to do in establishing a new covenant. You look at what Jesus did, both in his life, his death, and his resurrection. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, what does he speak to his Father in words of prayer? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He speaks words of forgiveness to the people who, have, who are killing him in that very moment. Even before Jesus goes to the cross, Barabbas is set free. The, the actions of Jesus create a new possibility for Barabbas, who was a, a political revolutionary and, 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 and was, was doomed to die. God creates a new possibility because of what Christ has done in his death and resurrection. So let's talk a little bit about this old covenant and new covenant, this new possibility that God is creating. The language of new covenant appears throughout the New Testament. Jesus uses it. Paul uses it. Uh, the book of Hebrews uses it as well. But this is the only place in the Old Testament that speaks about this new covenant. And there's, some, there's a fundamental difference between these covenants, a, a difference of quality that, that we need to understand uh, if we're going to understand the work of Christ. So we hear here in, in the book of um, Jeremiah chapter 31, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, a new possibility with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Here again, we have this metaphor of marriage as being used to describe the covenant relationship between God and his people. Covenant can be kind of a churchy word and it can feel kind of distant and informal. But really, when we talk about the covenant, we're talking about relationship, Right? And, and, and what terms of commitment and faithfulness are made for that relationship? It's not unlike a couple when they're getting married and vows are exchanged, saying, I will be faithful to you uh, th through thick and through thin. I, 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 will, I will be with you till death do us part in sickness and in health. I will be for you. I, I will be your cheerleader. All those vows that we make. And yet, we know that those vows that are permanent, they can be broken. They can be broken. And we see here that, that this old covenant has indeed been broken between the Lord and his people. So God says, I'm going to do something new. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord. The Old Testament, what was it written on? Or the Old Covenant was written on what? It was written on stone tablets given to Moses at Mount Sinai, chiseled into stone tablets. And, and, and that Old Covenant is applied to the people of God. Now, uh, think about this for a minute. How many people like someone else telling them what to do? <laughs> Anyone? My son is three years old, and, and I love the conflict that you see here. If it's my idea, it's a bad idea. If it's his idea, it's a great idea. And so when I say, Jeremiah, it's time to get your PJs on, he says, no, I don't want to put on my PJs. And then he pauses for a second. He says, actually, I want to put on my PJs. <laughs> you know, right? It's the same idea, the same covenant, and yet because it was his idea, it's a good idea. That's the problem with the Old Covenant. The, the, the Old Covenant comes at us from the outside. It's something external that's applied to our lives. And we all know what it's like to have somebody else tell us what to do. It, 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 we chafe against that a lot of times, don't we? It creates a certain hostility. So God says, rather than the covenant coming from the outside in, I'm going to give you that same covenant, but from the inside out. 
Here we're talking not about the application of laws to somebody's life and, and living according to a code, but we're talking about transformation. Of, of, of our very lives so that, so that what we do when we live with in this l- relationship of love with God would not be something that is a chore or a burden or something that we chafe against, but something that comes from the very core of who we are, comes from our very identity. That's what God's talking about here when he says, I'm going to create this new covenant, write it on your hearts. It's a change of identity. Following God and, and being a part of this new covenant is going to be as, as natural as breathing or eating and digesting. The things that are just a part of who we are, we don't even think about it. God says, I'm gonna, I'm, the people are going to know me from the least to the greatest. Nobody's going to need to tell one another, know the Lord. Why? Because my law, that same law, is not going to come from the outside, but it's already going to be in there. This is the incredible power of what God has done through Jesus Christ. Now, I'm, I'm going out on a limb here with this illustration, but I hope that you'll, you'll run with me. I've never had a, uh, a, a knee, knee pain that requires a, a great uh, deal of, of, of uh, tension. But I understand that if you have knee pain, you might try applying some Bengay to it, right? Uh, it, you, you would apply that on the outside, and it, it, it would do okay for a little while. Maybe you get a little further, and then you need cortisone shots, right? And, and, and that gets you a little further, but maybe at a certain point, uh, something coming from the outside in doesn't do it well enough anymore. But then a knee replacement can give you freedom from that pain. I'm not a doctor. Talk to your doctor if you think you need a knee replacement. But the point here is that what God wants to do is not like applying Ben Gay. It's not even like a shot that's coming into the center. It's a fundamental transformation from the inside out. He wants to, Ezekiel actually uses this language. He says, uh, my people's heart is hardened and and I'm going to give them a new heart. It's a language of heart transplant. That's what God wants to do through Jesus Christ to each of us. They shall be my people, and I will be their God. I will give them one heart. They will walk in one way, says the Lord. Now sometimes, um, just as an aside here, we can read this and, and, and think that we're talking maybe about Jews and Christians, this contrast between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. But I, I, I think that's actually, um, it's, it's not a good way to think about it because Jesus was Jewish and his disciples were Jewish and the message first came to the Jews. The difference here is not between Jews and Christians in the Old Covenant, New Covenant. The difference is between people who are recalcitrant, who, who, are, who are buried under the weight of all these layers, who, who are unwilling to change, unwilling to be touched by the very heart of God, and those who, who open ourselves up to God doing that work within us. That's the difference here. Who are we going to be? Are we going to be that that hardened, uh, numbed people? Or are we going to be a transformed people by the grace of Jesus Christ? In Luke 22, we heard the passage about Jesus. Here he is at, at, at the Last Supper with his disciples. This meal, what does that meal do? It tells the story of the covenant tells the story of, of God bringing his people out of Egypt and into the, the land that he's given them. And it's in this place that Jesus says, I'm actually creating a new covenant in my blood. We heard in the book of Hebrews a few months ago, not the bloods of bulls and goats, but my blood. I'm going to do something new in you, a new covenant that will, that, that, that will reconstitute my people. Jesus has 12 disciples, the 12 tribes of Israel. He's recreating his people by the power of his blood, the power of the resurrection. This is what Jesus has come to do for us. My friends, I wonder today, where is your numbness? What part of your life do you feel like you're just buried under the weight of all the sin? Perhaps it's things that you've done and and guilt and and things that you carry along with you. Or or perhaps it's things that have been done to you or things that have been said to you or labels that were put on you from an early age. Friends, where is your numbness? Where are you unable to feel? God wants to cut through all of that. God wants to cut through all of that to the heart. Friends, where are we tempted to despair? 
Where do we feel like there are no options, like there is no future? Do you hear the good news today that forgiveness creates new opportunities? That's what it does. That's what it does in our relationships with one another. When, when we come to that impasse, when my friend said to me, I feel like you're, you're dismissing me. I feel like you, like, like you don't take me seriously. The fact that forgiveness could flow between him and I meant that our relationship could be healed and could find newness. Forgiveness creates new possibilities. Forgiveness through Jesus Christ creates new possibilities for our relationship with God. That we might not be buried under this, uh, the sin in our lives. That we might not be crushed by the weight of all of that. But that we might find a new way forward where our old ways have failed. This is true newness, true transformation. Not just behavior modification so that we would act like God's people, but that our, our actions would flow out of a heart that is transformed and made new by the blood of Jesus. We sang about it today. He can wash us clean. He can make us right with God. He can offer us forgiveness for what has been done and open up a new possibility. My prayer for all of us and for our community is that our covenant faithfulness would be as natural as breathing as natural as eating. That we would know what it's like to serve not out of obligation or out of a sense of, 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 of what we should do, but out of a genuinely transformed heart. Jeremiah came to embody the very heart of God to his people. Friends, we in, in the world, we are called to be the body of Christ to represent the heart of God, the heart uh, whose, whose, whose anger lasts just for a moment, but whose love and faithfulness lasts for a lifetime and even beyond. Friends, that's what we're called to embody just as, as Jeremiah did in this moment where, where that hope pierces through the darkness of grief and despair. Because the truth is that God aches for his people. God aches for his people. He aches for each and every one of us. He wants us not to be buried under our sin. He wants us not to be in despair. But he wants to open up a new future, a new possibility. I'm going to leave you with these words. These are words that God spoke, uh, or Jeremiah spoke, the word of the Lord, about his people Ephraim. And I wonder if we could hear these words addressed to us, that we might know God's heart for us as well today, and his invitation to come to him. O oh, Ephraim, my dear, dear son, my child in whom I take pleasure, every time I mention his name, my heart bursts with longing for him. Everything in me cries out for him. Softly and tenderly, I wait for him. God is waiting. Will we respond? Let's pray. God, we thank you that in the midst of a lot of bad news, you give us hope for a future. Take us, O oh God. We are your people. Point to those hardened places in our lives, in our hearts. Do the work that only you can do to make us new, to transform us from the inside out. Amen.